Okay, so endotracheal intubation. So we finished uh, PE, uh, respiratory failure, and ARDS. As I mentioned, in patients with uh, respiratory failure and ARDS, the, what's the only treatment? In addition to managing the underlying causes? Why is it okay? Mechanical, mechanical ventilation. So we have to intubate in order to put someone on a mechanical ventilator. Mm -hmm. So we cannot put you on a vent with no artificial airway. So here's the procedure. First of all, we are not intubating the patient. We do, however, initiate it. So we initiate the intervention, the intubation, meaning you call rapid response or you call the doctor and tell them why your patient needs uh, to be intubated. So first is the uh, in, uh, indication. So therefore, who will need a endotracheal intubation? Uh, somebody going to ours, I guess. Okay, so here uh, we have two at least, respiratory failure and then uh, ARDS definitely need an airway. So here are the other in indications. So whenever a patient is having acute respiratory distress that cannot be treated with simpler methods. Others are, let's say, uh, who are comatose. So therefore they're at risk for aspiration so they cannot protect their airway, correct? So let's say stroke patients or head injury patients, severe head injury patients, wherein the reflexes are gone. There's no cough reflex, there's no gagging reflex. So we need to protect the airway with an artificial airway. And then finally, let's say for patients who are paralyzed, let's say in general anesthesia. So general anesthesia patients, we sedate them and we paralyze them, correct? So they receive a, a neuromuscular blocking agent. So they cannot breathe independently. So they have to have an airway. So this is the positioning. Again, we do not intubate patients. We do, however, initiate it. Uh, there are five nursing interventions, five nursing responsibilities when caring for a patient with an artificial airway. I'm sorry, you said we do not intubate it for what? We do not intubate. Okay. We initiate it though, meaning you call rapid response or the respiratory therapist or the doctor and tell them why your patient needs to be intubated. All right, again, the reasons are here in this first paragraph right here. So this is the position of the airway. Now it tells you here that the oral route is preferred, meaning we can also intubate through the naso, uh, the nares, meaning we can also do nasotracheal intubation but the mouth is preferred, oral is, is preferred, less trauma, lesser rates of infection compared to if you put it through the, uh, through the nares. Okay. So this is the position of the airway. You need to secure the, um, the trachea, meaning secure the, um, not secure, um, <coughs> You want to ensure, uh, let me remember the five interventions. So your responsibilities are number one is to maintain patency because this is the only way the patient will breathe through the tube. So breath comes in through the tube, must also come out through the tube. So therefore, mm -hmm. does that tube need, need to be patent? Yes. Now, just like when you put anything into your mouth, a lollipop, a toothpick, uh, a pencil, what happens to in your mouth when you put something in it? Yeah. It will stimulate secretions. So saliva will increase, mucus will increase, right? So will there be increased secretions while the tube is in the airway? Yes. So will there be secretions inside the airway? Yes. yes. So we do we need to ensure patency? How do we accomplish that? Suctioning. Suctioning, okay. Mm -hmm. So number one is ensuring a patent airway. Next is we're going to look at two uh, 
two common methods in order to ensure the proper placement because we need to know that it's really in the right place. Look at your anatomy. We have the esophagus behind the trachea, correct? So when the, whoever's intubating this patient, the respiratory therapist, or let's say the doctor or the nurse anesthetist, for instance, when we put the laryngoscope in, are we sure that it's in the trachea? Okay, so therefore, do we need to ensure or verify tube placement? Yeah. Okay, so that's the second uh, responsibility. So we need to verify placement. We need to make, make sure the airway is patent. Number three is um, we need to properly seal the trachea because will the tube be a snug fit in the trachea? Yes. Will it be a snug fit, like perfect fit? Oh, no. no. So therefore, do we need something to seal this? Because if we don't seal the, the trachea, meaning our tube is not the exact width of the, of the size of the trachea, the, the tracheal diameter, will all our breath go in and out through the tube only? Or will it leak around the sides? Yeah. Okay, it will leak around the sides. So we need to ensure proper cuff infl uh, inflation in order to make sure that there's no leaking of air in during inhalation or during exhalation. Now, is the trachea made of living tissue? Yeah. So it's dead tissue? It's like no, plastic. No, 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 no. Okay, so will there be blood vessels in there? Okay, so therefore, can there be a chance that we we could overinflate the cuff or maybe underinflate the cuff? Yes. There's the chance, right? So uh, we'll, that's the third. We need to ensure proper cuff inflation. We have methods to do that and we have parameters that we follow. Number four is to ensure proper oxygenation. Um, how do we know that we are properly um, providing uh, adequate oxygenation to the patient? How do we know? This patient is intubated, they're sedated, they're not conscious, they cannot tell you anything. Saturation. What is the better measure? Which is more uh, accurate, the pulse ox or the ABG? Oh, the ABG. Okay, so ABGs will have to be drawn. So that's how we know that whether or not we provided proper or adequate oxygenation. Again, the so when do we do ABGs? How do you know you need to get an ABG? Again, this whole time this patient is unconscious, cannot tell you anything. So can you tell the patient's mental status if they're sedated? No. So how do we know? So how often are we therefore drawing ABGs? Now, give me a frequency. Like when would you draw ABGs? Every shift. So that's once a shift, once every 12 hours. That's your okay. One, so you're doing it routinely, like schedule, or is it again? When, when, so let's say you, you do every six hours. So if we do six every six hours, what happens in between those six hours? So if the patient is not stable, yeah. Okay, so the better answer would be anytime there's a change or uh, Indira mentioned as needed. So the as needed conditions would be if there's a change in the patient status or if you make a change in the therapy. Because let's say you increase the oxygen or you decrease the oxygen flow on the mechanical ventilator. How do you know what effect that change made to your patient? ABG. All right. So how often again do we draw ABGs? Whenever there is, okay, either a change in the patient's condition or a change in the therapy. 
Because you need to evaluate, evaluate what did the what effect did your change have on your patient? Let's say you increase this, you decrease this. Well, what did that do to your patient? You follow? Okay, and number five will be securing the airway. Will this airway move? Let's say we just put it there and then there's no tape or anything holding it. Will it move? Yes. So therefore you need to secure the airway. Long ago, we used to use tape. Now, no more because uh, tape does what to the skin? Because is this patient gonna have this airway for just a couple hours? Imitation and skin. Okay, so it will cause skin breakdown, right? So if you have an adhesive constantly on the skin, it will cause skin breakdown. What else? If the a patient drools and sweats, for instance, what happens to the adhesive? Is it still secure? It's gonna fall off. So what's the better material in order to secure the airway? Velcro. Okay, so we have Velcro straps. I'll show you a picture. So we call that an ET tube holder. We have different brands. Uh, this would be the most commonly used. So we have pads. It's made of plastic, but it has Velcro straps now. So all you do is tighten or loosen the straps to make it secure. Uh, another thing, this tube, is it pressing and putting pressure on the mucosa? On the lips, yes. On the lips only? What about the tongue, the gums, the cheeks? Okay. So should it stay in the same place all the time? No. Can we move it? Okay, we can move it. Just don't pull or push on it, but you can put it side to side. So you, uh, how I do it is, let's say, to, just to remind me, whenever I turn my patient, let's say I turn my patient to the right side, so that will also be my cue to put the airway in the right side. And then left side, and then you turn that also on the left side, just so you don't forget, because you have to do it every two hours, so might as well include these. Um, when we suction, which area do we actually suction? Uh, the airway or do we suction the mouth as well? Both. 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 Yeah. Okay. How often do we suction? As needed. As needed. Okay, so later we'll we'll review the those as needed um conditions. So let's start with uh, number one, let's just go down the list. I mean, the chapter. So is it our job to verify tube placement? Yes. 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 Okay. It should be sitting two centimeters above the carina. Where is the carina? Where's the carina? Um, it's, the it's in the... Okay, so where your left and right main stem bronchi branch, that is the carina. Okay, So if it was, let's say, you standing up, so that would be your perennial area, that would be the carina. Okay, so that, that fork right there, that would be the carina. So the tip, the end of the tube, this one, this tip right here, should sit two centimeters above the carina. How do we know if it's there or not? How do you verify that? X-ray. X-ray. So what do what will be ordered right after the ET tube is inserted? X-ray. Chest X-ray. The other, because will it be fast to get the x-ray? Like, no, can you no. get the results right away? No. no. Uh, you do have init an initial, meaning uh, we have electronic uh, results now, so it can be read right away. However, it still takes a few minutes. But 
do we wait therefore for x-ray confirmation before we can start using the tube? No. no. So we have to ensure proper cuff uh, verify placement by some other way. So the other way is checking the end tidal CO2 level. So what is an end tidal CO2 level? So we measure that using a capnographer. Capnography, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. So it's a device. There are handheld capnographers like this one. We also have machines, same size as your blood pressure machines. And this device will detect carbon dioxide levels, all right? So it will detect what? Carbon, carbon dioxide, dioxide levels. So we put the sensor right here at the tip of the endotracheal tube and it will give you, well, it depends on the machine. The machines, some machines will give you numbers, let's say 35 to 45, or it will give you a color. So the color will change as it detects CO2 levels. So what is the normal end tidal CO2 level? ABG, so 35 to 45, okay. So it, as long as it's normal or high, then we know where is the tube? Is it in the trachea or in the esophagus? It's in the trachea. So what are the two ways again to verify tube placement? Okay, so it should be both, not one or the other. But the fastest way would be what? Capnography first, followed by the x-ray. Now, what if the tip is not in the right place? It's not exactly two centimeters above the carina. What do you think will be done? Reposition. Okay, so the radiologist will give the respiratory therapist or anybody instruction. So on the x-ray result, it will say where the tube is and then it will say recommendation because there are numbers on the tube and the radiologist will tell you exactly how much to push it, how many millimeters to push it or how many millimeters to pull it. So this is not like the arm, um, the end, the... It's not a perfect, yeah, because we can't we can't tell where your carina is. We can just estimate because is everybody's carina in the same spot? No, the taller you are, so of course the longer your trachea. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so we need an X-ray. <clears throat> okay, so that is verifying tube placement number two, ensuring proper cuff inflation. Now, how exactly do we inflate the cuff. <clears throat> we have what's called a manometer. Everybody knows what a tire gauge monitor is, right? Yeah, when you put it on the tire and then it'll give you a pressure. Yeah, how many PSIs are in your tire? Okay, so it measures tire inflation pressure, correct? So this one will do the same. Now, it's not giving us the side, but uh, on the side of this will be something like this. You see this part? Okay, so uh, behind this on the side is something like this. This is where you attach the pilot balloon. Let me show you a, <clears throat> this is not shown on our... Yes, this, yeah, so you see that little, this blue part here, this one, mm. right, this one, this is called the pilot balloon. So this is the ET tube, and then this is the cuff, and this is outside. So this will be hanging out right here. So it's outside the patient's neck. You will connect this to the manometer, and then there's a, trigger behind this okay, when, that you press and it will read the pressure. So how much pressure must be there? What is the proper cuff inflation? 
Okay, there are two measurements here. On the manometer, it will read two units, either millimeters of mercury or centimeters of water. I don't know what the NCLEX will use, so we will have to memorize both. So how much in millimeters of mercury? 20 to 25, how about in centimeters of water? 24 to 30. All right. So what will happen if we under inflate the cuff? Let's say this is not inflated enough. Besides the tube coming out. Well, not likely because we have, uh, remember there's a strap around the patient's head holding the airway in place. So what will happen if this is under inflated? Not enough pressure in there. Meaning it's flat, not inflated enough. Oh, then it wouldn't provide proper oxygen. So what will happen? So what will what will occur around the area where we don't have a seal? A leak. What will leak? Air will leak. What else? Can the patient have any control over secretions that will come down here? No. So what will happen to that secretion? It will go straight into the lungs. Now, is that clean? Because let's say this had initially a good cough inflation, correct? Good pressure. Are there secretions here already? How old do you think those secretions are? I don't know. Since this patient was intubated. So therefore, if those secretions, let's say they're 24, 36 hours old, we know what our mouth smells like when we wake up in the morning. And that's just what? Six, eight hours of sleep. I smell good. So what will happen if those secretions that smell really good goes into your lungs? Pneumonia will result. Uh, plus the more, uh, what about if, so you know the effects if it's underinflated, right? Yeah. So will there be a leak? Meaning every breath that goes in here, will they go into the lungs completely if there's a leak? Um, no, it will leak around. So therefore, because is there a resistance posed by the lungs as the ventilator delivers the breath? Yes, because the lungs are not, there's no hole in it, right? So it's like a plastic bag. So if you if you ventilate it, you put you push a breath into it, will there be resistance? Yes, there is a resistance. Uh, let me sh grab the... <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. But you participated, you know what's going on. Or just look at the um, old recording also. Anyway, we're back. Uh, let's go to ventilation now. Now, let's keep this simple. A mechanical ventilator is actually a computerized bag valve mask. You know what a bag valve mask is? Yeah. Where you put the yes or no? Bag, right? Yeah, that's the bag that we have where you manually ventilate. Yeah. Okay, that's the bag valve mask. So what is this again? A? Yeah, so no. I mean, no, in no. no, so I was talking about the uh, bag valve mask. So I said, what is this? a computerized bag wow. valve mask. So instead of the pay, uh, the nurse or the CNA pushing the bag, giving the breath, who's doing it for us? This thing here. Can this break down? Yes. So when you have this at your bedside, what must you also have at the bedside? Ambu bag. A bag valve mask as well, or an yeah. ambu bag. All right, are we clear? So whenever I go into my patient who's on a vent, what must I look for? I must have an ambu bag because can this break down? What happens if this breaks down? My patient screwed. So what should I have there at the bedside? Okay, always have them. So again, what is this? A glorified ambu bag. Okay. So it's is it useful though? Yeah. Yes. Imagine having to ventilate the patient 12 to 14 times a minute for 12 hours. You won't be able to do anything else, correct? 
So what's the purpose of the mechanical ventilator? So let's read. Again, for patients who are undergoing uh, major surgery, let's say um, general anesthesia, uh, whenever a patient is too weak, let's say in PE, respiratory failure, or ARDS, for instance, and then the patient's, if the patient's breathing 40 to 50 times a minute, how long can you last doing that? Let's try it. Breathe 10 times in 15 seconds. As too fast. Can you can you last? No. So what can the ventilator help with that? Yes. Okay. So meaning before or after the patient's already fatigued? Before. Before. Okay. So when you see the patient in respiratory distress, do you wait until uh, I'll wait until they stop breathing and then I'll call a code? Okay, so of course you anticipate, right? This nobody can last that long. So you anticipate and help your patient. We, you can forget about the negative pressure ventilators because they're in, uh, let me just show you what it looks like. <clears throat> so these are the negative pressure ventilators. They're huge. So they were used in the, after World War II. Okay? So that's basically what it looks like. So is it can we do this in the hospital? No. How do you clean doo doo? <laughs> How do you turn the patient? <laughs> yes, only the head is sticking out. So is this a practical device? No. So it belonged, and you can see them in museums only. So now we only have positive pressure ventilators. So all ventilators now are positive pressure because. Negative pressure ventilators mimicked or tried to imitate the human body because how do we breathe again? Human beings breathe how? Our bodies, are we positive or negative pressure ventilators? We are negative pressure ventilators. As the diaphragm contracts down, air is sucked into the, into the lungs. So same way. So these things also do, do that. So they as, long, as soon as you seal the door, it creates a vacuum sucking air from the atmosphere into the patient's lung. So this is how these things work. Enter the mechanical ventilators, which are positive pressure ventilators. So now they push positive pressure air into our lungs. Indications again, I already made uh, mention of the example. So this will be good for select all that apply, correct? Oh, got your attention. All right. So these are the indications who will need mechanical ventilation okay? in addition to the ones I mentioned. <clears throat> okay. So there are two uh, major types of ventilators. There are volume cycle ventilators, and there are also time cycle ventilators, and a few are pressure cycle ventilators. Regardless of what type, there are certain settings on it. Let's go to the settings. So I mentioned volume cycle, pressure cycle, or uh, high frequency, or that's also called uh, time cycle um, ventilators. Oh, we have a chart. Okay, chart 19-4 are your other indications for mechanical ventilation. Does it meet criteria for respiratory failure? Yes. See, PaO2 less than 60, PaO, PaCO2 over 45 or over 50. Okay. <clears throat> now, I, again, I won't test you on what type of ventilators they are. I will test you on the settings. Because regardless if it's volume, pressure, or high-frequency ventilators, they will have the same settings. <clears throat> Do you know what uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilators are? Give me two examples. There are only two. CPAP, CPAP and BiPAP. BiPAP. Okay, so those are non-invasive positive pressure ventilators. So CPAP and BiPAP. Uh, before we go to settings, since the mode came first, 
uh, let's discuss the most common modes only. On the unit, because you don't work in the OR, do you? Okay, we don't have any rotations in the OR. So therefore, there are only two modes most commonly used in the in, in the unit. So let's say you're on the med surge tele or ICU, medical ICU, surgical ICU. They only use two, uh, most common anyway. First is assist control. All patients, and I should say all, um, majority, let's say Ibiana just went into respiratory failure and Asia is her nurse. Asia called the doctor, hey, my uh, EB is not doing well. Okay, she needs intubated. Okay, so doctor agreed. Okay, let's intubate. The uh, this is not part of the test. I'm just going to describe. So we now do rapid sequence intubation. <clears throat> so this will last probably 20 or 30 seconds. The intubation is finished that quick. How does it happen? Because we sedate the patient. So Evie, as, as, as soon as she has an IV access, so she will be given either rocuronium or vecuronium or propofol. She'll be, be given IV push. She's out like a light in like two seconds. And then we will insert the laryngoscope and then followed by the and the tracheal tube. And then we'll go on with verification, uh, cough inflation, et cetera. Okay, so usually it takes about 20 or 30 seconds. Is it peaceful? Well, she was sedated. So is it going to be peaceful? Yes. She's, is she going to fight? No, because she's out like a light. So therefore, without rapid sequence, can it be disastrous? Yes. Yes, because no matter how weak a patient is, what happens to the patient's mental status before all this? They're confused, right? There's restlessness because there's no oxygen. That's why we're intubating in the first place. You follow? Okay, so therefore, it's better and more peaceful. No injuries to myself or to the patient, meaning nobody gets kicked in the, in the groin. Nobody loses their teeth because this patient will fight. Okay, imagine if I were going to force, you're confused, and then I force a stainless steel laryngoscope into your throat and then insert a plastic tube, and you're already confused to begin with. Is it going to be peaceful? Are you going to put up a fight? Oh, of course. <clears throat> so we do rapid sequence intubation. Now, of course, is the patient's lungs good or bad at this point? It's still bad. So we put the patient on this mode first. Now, this is a volume mode. I'll explain volume and uh, pressure shortly. So when it's a volume mode, there are two things preset. <clears throat> so let's say I put this on the volume mode. I have to tell the ventilator two things. First is, there are two things preset. There must be a preset rate. And I have to tell the ventilator how many breaths to give every minute. <clears throat> and then I have also to tell it how much air to give with it every breath. What are those two again? Race uh, and air. Volume. And volume. For purposes of discussion, the volume, we'll call it tidal uh -huh. volume. So every volume of air that it gives with every breath will be called tidal volume. Tidal volume <laughs> can be either calculated based on your weight or your height. Most facilities use the weight. When it's the weight, it will be about six to eight mLs per kilogram. <clears throat> or if it's the height, uh, I forgot the formula for height, but 90% of facilities use the weight. <clears throat> so it's about six to eight mLs per kilogram uh, of tidal volume. So average person's tidal volume would be around 300 to 400. Let's say 300, 350, right around there. Of course, the heavier the patient, then the higher the tidal volume. <clears throat> so what are two things preset under assist control? I have to tell the ventilator how much. Usually it's around 10, 10, 12, right around there. 
And tidal volume, how much again is the average? It's About, like no, in mLs. How many mLs is that? About 300, okay, let's say 350. <clears throat> Another name for assist control is um, continuous mandatory ventilation, CMV <clears throat> or AC. <clears throat> CMV or assist control. <clears throat> Why is it called that? Because it, look at the mandatory part. What do we mean by mandatory? Does the patient have a choice to say, no, I don't want a breath right now? No, it's mandatory. So whether the patient likes it or not, will they get a breath? Yes. <clears throat> so therefore, the patient will get a minimum. What is that minimum again? is based on the preset rate, right? So let's say let's say if Taylor puts in 12, how many breaths will the patient get? 12. Whether the patient breathes or not, how much will how many breaths will they get every minute? 12. It will give 12, okay, no matter what happens. Every time the vent gives a breath, how much will the patient receive under CMV or AC? Whatever is preset. Again, what are the two things preset? Yeah. The volume and the rate. Okay. So 12 times the patient will get how much? 350 ml or whatever is the preset tidal volume. Are you following so far? Can the patient take a breath on their on them on their own? I mean they're not really um, dead. I mean, they're alive. They're, they're just on a ventilator. So can the patient take a breath? Yes, they can. Okay. So let me explain here. Right here. So in AC, also called continuous mandatory CMV, it delivers what again? A preset tidal volume at a preset rate. So it'll get, it'll, they'll, let's say the preset tidal volume is 350. Preset rate is 12. So they will get how much? 350, how many times? 12 times every minute. Okay, you follow so far? However, look at there. However, if the patient initiates a breath between the machine's breaths, because they're allowed to do that, they can breathe. Let's say, so if it delivers 12 and there's 60 seconds in a minute, so every how many seconds will the vent deliver a breath? 60 divided by 12 equals? Five. five. So every five seconds, the patient will get 350. You agree? Right? Okay. Can the patient d breathe in between during those five seconds? Yeah. Yes, they can. However... What will happen though when they initiate a breath? What will the vent do? The patient will re receive the preset tidal volume. Therefore, can the patient control how much they receive, how much tidal volume they receive? Wait, so can they control it? Meaning yes. when they breathe, I only want 100. Oh, can no. they do that? No. no. So can they control the tidal volume? No. The patient has no control over the tidal volume. Can the patient control the rate? Yes, because the patient can breathe, can add to it. Can the patient breathe less though? No. no, no. Can, they pre can they ever breathe less than 12? No. They will always get 12. Can they possibly get 24? Yes. yes, they can add to it because it depends on, it's up to the patient. You want extra breath? Sure, but can they control the tidal volume during those spontaneous breaths? They can. So you said that they can't control, they can control the tidal volume, but overall, couldn't they control it if they increase that, 20, if that 12 to 24? It wouldn't... The rate they can control. They can change the rate. They can add to it. They can never lower the rate, though. 
No, but I'm talking about end title volume for a minute because if they're breathing 12 respirations. What do you mean end title volume? Just say title volume. Okay, so title okay. volume. So mm -hmm. say, for instance, they're breathing 12 respirations at 300. Right, you said three, 350. 350. Mm -hmm. So when the maths is done, you'd probably end up with like what three thousand. No, 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 no. You're talking about minute ventilation now. That's different. Okay. We're just talking about tidal volume, meaning tidal volume is the amount of air delivered with each breath. So if let's say uh, this line here is zero pressure. And we can tell whether it's the ventilator giving the breath based on the pressure. Is the ventilator positive or negative? Positive. positive. So the patient will get a breath from the vent. You always, let's say this is zero pressure. Zero. It goes like this. Mm -hmm. Like this. It won't go to zero. I'll go to peep later, probably next week. So this is now your peak inspiratory pressure. And this is zero pressure, okay? So every how many seconds again? If the, title, uh, if, the if the rate is 12, every how many seconds? Okay, every five seconds. So let's say this is one, two, three, four, five. So the patient will get another breath here. Psst. Okay, exactly 350. All right, you follow? So another five seconds later, one, two, three. Okay, another five seconds. Psh. All right. Can the patient take their own breath? Yes. So let's say they're due here. The machine will, the vent will give a breath here. All right. Every five second interval. If the patient decides to breathe here, we, we can see it because it will go negative. Because are we negative pressure ventilators or positive? We are negative. negative. So, of course, when the diaphragm does this, can the machine detect the negative pressure? Okay. Yes, that will be the trigger for the vent. The vent, vent says, ah, I see. The pressure went negative. You're trying to get a breath. Here, let me give it to you. The vent will give how much? Exactly 350. It won't let you choose anything else. You can initiate it, but... It won't let you choose it how much. Then, will it then reset and just do five seconds from that moment? No, right? that's the problem. Let me see here. Let, let me show you. Right here, since it's already time, correct? Yeah. It's time for the next breath. You will get another breath because it's mandatory. That's what it means by mandatory, continuous mandatory ventilation. Every single five seconds, you will get a breath, whether you like it or not. Correct. So therefore, the patient is what I mean by the patient can add to it. They can never get less than 12. Can they make it 24? Can they make it 36? Yes, it's up to them how many they want. But what do you think the patient will feel? Look at this. So five seconds. Time, five seconds. Let's look at that clock. <clears throat> okay, go. I'll go. <laughs> 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 see, see what happens to me now if that happens every every minute by minute what will I what ABG problem will I develop will it increase no, what am I doing am I hypo or am I hyperventilating I'm hyperventilating so what will happen to my ABG so respiratory what Alkalosis. So what's the complication of this mode? Alkalosis. So can a patient stay on AC for long? No. If they go, if they get better, can they stay on this thing? No. 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 So this is only indicated for what? What do you say? Correct. Only during the acute episode. So initial episode, meaning you just went into respiratory failure, you just had PE, you were in ARDS, whatever, will put you on AC. Once you get better, can I keep you on this thing? No, no because is this appropriate? No. Is this comfortable? No, you're going to suffer with this. Okay, So we can't put good patients on this. I mean, I should say but good, but better. But patient gets better. Breathing more on their own, take them off this, 
put them on the next mode, which we will discuss next week. Okay.